Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Harold Cudler and I will be moderating uh, this webinar, Psychoanalytic Emotional Support in Times of War. This is part two of a series. Um, the war in Ukraine isn't yet over. Uh, and over time, the emotional consequences have forced the psychoanalytic community to organize and to continue working uh, to lessen the impacts on all of our members. Uh, in today's webinar, three colleagues immersed in this highly complex context are going to share their institutional, clinical, and community experiences, and participants will have a chance to pose questions and join uh, in uh, today's discussion. Uh, Again, my name is Harold Cudler. I will be moderator for today's session. I am uh, an associate consulting professor at Duke University and also an adjunct professor at the United States Uniformed Services University. My work has been with veterans. Uh, I'm also the president of the Psychoanalytic Center of the Carolinas. Uh, other speakers today uh, will be Alexandra Mirza. Uh, she is an authorized training analyst and child and adolescent analyst uh, and president of the Ukrainian Psychoanalytic Society, um, as well as secretary and training analyst in the Child and Adolescent Psychoanalytic Training Program. Uh, our second speaker will be Anna Kravstova, uh, who is uh, the secretary of the Ukrainian Psychoanalytic Society, a member of the training committee of that society, uh, and also developmental director of the uh, Early Intervention Institute in Kharkiv, Ukraine. And our third speaker will be Eriber uh, Blass, training and supervising psychoanalysts for adults, children, and adolescents, and also specialist in psychosomatic medicine and psychotherapy, uh, a, a member of the German Psychoanalytic Association, the IPA, and president of the European Psychoanalytic Federation. He's uh, works in private practice in Dusseldorf, Germany. I need to say at the outset that each of our uh, part, uh, panelists speaks from a different place, uh, both uh, in terms of their uh, location, but also their personal experience and connection to the events we'll be discussing. Uh, each, by the way, will be speaking for themselves and not officially for the IPA. Um, I'm in the United States at a, a great distance from uh, the events that are happening in Europe. Uh, Araber is the uh, president of the European Psychoanalytic Federation, speaking from his, uh, his location in Germany. Um, Alexandra, I believe, is still uh, in, uh, is in Budapest. And Anna, I believe, is still in Ukraine. Um, I also want to mention for context that the organizers have made a decision not to invite uh, our Russian colleagues to join us in today's meeting. There are longstanding relations between the IPA, between Ukrainians and Russian psychoanalysts. But the, the, the concept here was to provide the greatest possible freedom for our Ukrainian colleagues today. And the sense was that uh, that might not be possible if we were to uh, invite uh, Russians to join us. This is not to say there aren't or shouldn't be other venues where people can reach out across boundaries, even across combat areas. But uh, the decision today was to provide, again, the most possible freedom for an open discussion without anyone feeling hurt or, uh, or targeted in that conversation or, or stifled in their ability to speak. So at this point, I would like to turn um, uh, the conversation over to our first speaker, Alexandra. Each speaker will have 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, again, uh, those of you who have questions to ask uh, can put them forward to the organizer. If there's any question about that, keep an eye on the chat box and uh, that will provide you direction. Thank you. And Alexandra, the, uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Harold, for the uh, presentation. And thank you for inviting me to take part in the webinar. 
and the opportunity to tell about the experience of Ukrainian psychoanalytical society we got from the winter of 2022 till now. It's very symbolic that we are holding our webinar on the day of the Ukrainian defender of the fatherland. On this day, we honor the men and women who stood up for Ukraine, remember those who died and, the, and the, in this struggle. So I ask for a minute of silence to honor their memory. Thank you. As many of you know, recently there were massive missile attacks on the territory of all Ukraine. That remind us the beginning of the unexpected, unbelievable full-scale war and attack on Kiev on 21st of February 2022. But this time it was much more missiles fired on our cities, civil homes and important infrastructure. Our colleagues who had returned to Ukraine, relatives and friends who had reminded there, have experienced stress and panic again. They were victims, dead and wandered civil people. People were forced to hide for hours in the basement of houses and in subway stations. The sense of security was damaged yet again. Everything that could be destroyed, uh, restored and strengthened during the seven months of the war has sh was shaken again. Shaken, but not crumbled. During these seven months, UPS has overcome a long way of transformation. We were lost and found each other again, destro destroyed and restored, survived, adapted, helped each other and others. And we were not alone in this path but with the support of the international professional community, our colleagues and friends. UPS is a rather young professional community that was formed as an all-Ukrainian association of professionals who are oriented at APA standards in 2011. In 2017, we became a study group. Today, UPS consists 16 IPA members and 26 candidates. Most of members of the UPS have known each other for 20 and more years. And therefore, we are quite close night community. From the very beginning of the full scale war, it was extremely important for us to be in touch with each other, as well as with friends and relatives. It was important to know that everyone whom we wished good night in the evening to woke up in the morning. This wish ceased to be formal. In Kiev, Kharkiv, Sumy, and other cities of Ukraine, the situation worsened. Some colleagues were under occupation. Others were under constant shelling and were not able to go out to buy food or water. Everyone was scared, confused, and helpless. Gradually, a feeling began to arise that we had to and we can do something about it to get ourselves out, help our, our colleagues to get out of the shelled cities and move to the safe places. The UPS Mutual Assistance hand, Headquarters was created. It included active members of the society who had an emotional, physical and technical capabilities to help others. It was again a close knit group that reacted very quickly to rapidly changing situation. Maria Budya, head of this headquarters, showed miracle of efficiency and organization. The board of UPS and the hot headquarters was in close cooperation with the board of EPF and the presidents of the European Psychoanalytical Society. Herbert Blas, who is here presented, Eva Glot, Andrea Gadini, and Christian Hack made a great contribution helping Ukrainian refugees. Thanks to the cooperation, half of the members and candidates of the UPS found refugee in Europe countries and uh, that sheltered us during active hostilities. We received urgent and timely financial support from EPF and EPI. Uh, letter from our colleagues uh, from all over the world 
express sympathy and solidarity, supported us emotionally. And it was very important for us to know that we are not alone in this awful war. UPS members and candidates received uh, psychological help, help from the, in the form of a reflective group led by Shmuel Erlich, Mira Erlich, you know, Dorothy von Tipelskir, Ising, represented partners in confronting and collective atrocities. They helped the group members express their feelings and regain their working capacity and vitality. As a sense of relatively security returned, UPS began to develop links between the APA committees, COCAP, COAP, PACE. It is important for UPS members not only to receive help, but also to provide it to our compatriots. Thus, four group of child psychotherapists were organized by the supervision support of child and adolescent training analyst of COCAP and PASE. We spent hours in discussion on, organize, on organizing question uh, between Anna Kravtsova, present here, Antonia Grimald and Monica Cardinal. Even in the most difficult times in March 2022, Ukrainian child psychotherapists continued their volunteers' work, helping children and comprehend their catastrophic experience and survive psychically. Professionals from Georgia, Serbia, Hungary, Latvia and other countries helped us uh, with the necessary theoretical and clinical seminars on volunteers' basis. Sorry that I don't mention all the names, but we remember everybody and appreciate your warm support and contribution. I would like to highlight also the cooperation with COVAP in person of Emanuela Kvaliata and Hatuna Ivanishvili and their colleagues. In productive collaboration, we delivered three large seminars on the topic of psychological support of colleagues working with refugee pregnant women. We plan to continue such seminars with regular supervision with Emanuela and her colleagues for professionals working with this category of Ukrainian citizens. During the war since 2014, uh, we as a psychoanalyst came face, with the, with, uh, came face to face with the other side of life. War trauma, tortured people, homeless and refugee. They say, represented by Darren Thompson and uh, Louis Kirsner, supported Ukrainians who work in hospitals with wandered soldiers in Kharkiv, Zaporozhye and Truskovets. But even in such awful circumstances, life is gone. There is no only rupture of ties and pain, but also meeting love babies. That is surprising, but even uh, during uh, the war, even under shelters, sh shelling, infant observation seminar is turned out to be possible. Sure, uh, being a refugee hiding in basements without electricity, mobile connection, all these factors do not continue, uh, do not contribute to maintain stable contact, a thoughtful ob uh, observation, monitoring one's feeling. However, some observations are continued. And that is very meaningful for us. It is a picture of a careful containment in different levels, but by observer and by the group discussion. It's like layers of care that UPS got from friends, colleagues and professional organization. That helps us to regain energy and to maintain our professional identity. The development of the professionals in the field uh, to help of, uh, for pregnant women, babies and their parents is not possible to imagine without great contribution of Tessa Baradon. During the last months, we had opportunity to exchange ideas with colleagues from uh, World Association of Infant Mental Health, who had uh, already been able to summarize their experience of working with trauma in scientific articles and methodological recommendations. Estrid Birkberg, uh, Hisako Watanabe, Miri Karen, Tessa Baradon, uh, helped to establish a service for Ukrainian babies and their parents as in Ukraine, so in abroad. The supervision group under the leadership of TESA is constantly working, creating a container for Ukrainian specialists 
and through us helping Ukrainians who need help. As you can see, the members and candidates of Ukrainian uh, psychoanalytical society are, are wrapped in the care and support of our colleague. It gives us strength not to give up, to develop, to transform our traumatic experience into a story that can be shared. Ukrainian colleagues take part in the conference on other, of other psychoanalytic communities in Poland, Germany, Italy, Austria. UPS regularly organizes meeting of friends initiated and actively participated in by Igor Romanov, head of the Ukrainian uh, Psychoanalytical Society Training Committee. Using the opportunity on behalf of the Ukrainian Psychoanalytical Society, I would like to express our deep gratitude to all our friends, colleagues, EPF and IPA board that res uh, respond to our tragedy and did everything to make us feel like a members of a large family of professionals, not indifferent to the pain of others. During this intense period, we received so many letters of support and proposition of help that we were not able to answer it uh, or not being in regular contact to realize these valuable ideas. But I hope that we have time and forces to be together. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. And we're going to proceed directly to our second speaker, Anna Kravtsova. Thank you. Uh, I want to continue the topic on uh, mental survival of uh, Ukrainian child patients and their therapist during the war. And uh, I read my some notes about this. This is not the first war in Europe experiences by psychoanalysis. These words I heard from a colleague in one of the many discussions in which we try to think together about what is happening not the first war what does it mean does this mean the war for sure will end does this mean that psychoanalysis will develop new theories and new approaches does does this mean we and our patient will survive there are our hopes and what we have now Parents always bring their children to the consulting rooms of analysts and uh, psychoanalytic psychotherapists to help their children development. Many psychoanalytic psychotherapists have focused on opening up a safe, stable, predictable space in inner world of the little patient starting with the setting, starting with the security, and organized with big love, rooms with toys, pillows, carpets. This don't exist anymore. A colleague, a therapist from Kharkiv, said with big pain, my playroom, where I saw my little patients, on the 1st of March was destroyed. A portrait of Dr. Winnicott in a wooden frame remains on the wall, books and toys on the floor. A beloved knitted doll, Masha, she survived. My good object. The war challenged the most important thing for the development of the child in the world security, stability, and predictability. And what about child therapists? Four groups discussing the clinical material of child therapies. This is more than 30 Ukrainian psycho psychoanalytic psychotherapists and psychoanalysts with the support of IPA com committee cock up and pace, we try to understand what is happening with therapies, patients, and the therapies. 
what we learn from each other. Our playroom and usual settings are destroyed. But way of survival is as diverse as life itself. How Ukrainian psychotherapists and their young patients work now? Online, because psychotherapists and patients refugees in different countries or different cities. Online also because the patient can be in his or her city, but the therapist is forced to leave. Or therapist is in his or her city, but family with young patient are forced to leave. Or also online because the therapist and patient are together in one city, but the city is under shelling and it is very dangerous to meet, meet each other in the office. Sometimes uh, our colleague and their patient could see each other personally with big anxiety, with big hopes, sometimes with despair. A colleague from Dnipro, a city that has been hit by Russian missiles during the past week, said, some colleagues left the country and thought it was crazy to continue working, but I just couldn't leave my teenager patients. Is this craziness, child and adolescent psychoanalytic psychotherapy and psychoanalysis in such conditions? Two years ago, we overcome the challenges associated with COVID. Children's therapists around the world shared their discoveries and experiences of on online work with children and adolescents. It was difficult, but step by step, we appreciate the contribution of new technologies to the psychoanalytic approach and we are able to use their possibilities. But as we discussed somehow in clinical group, we have never felt a burning hatred for the virus. The virus often forced the families of young patients to be together at home, but the war divided them in the cruelest way. If the child lives with mom and dad, then he or she is most likely in the insecure state on the territory of constantly shelled Ukraine. A mount constantly destroyed schools, kindergarten, playgrounds, often without light, or communication. But if he or she child is in immigration, in physical safety, then as a rule, he or she are separated from his or her father and other relatives and friends. The impact of the cruelty of this choice without choice this ugly embodiment of Oedipal fantasies in the external and the internal world of young patients. We have to understand and experience in the future. But right now, every child therapist is faced every day with a clash of joy of survival and guilt openness to new things and fear of strangers, new acquaintance and terrible loneliness and loss of friends, games and helplessness and anxiety and fear. This is really a storm in the inner world of young patient. Storm in every session. Ukrainian therapists starts every day with news. 
they keep quite specific question in their minds. Are the houses of their loved one destroyed? Are there electricity and communication so that uh, online meetings can take place? Are the members of uh, patients' families alive? Are alive the young patients themselves? Children die in Ukraine almost every day. Physical death and destruction are visible right now. But how to evaluate the death and destruction of children's inner world? Child psychotherapists begin each day with the hope of doing the best of impossible and thinking under the fire. It is, is it really possible to think under the fire? Not in the sense of internal storms, but literally. In fact, we have a situation where traumatized therapists work with traumatized young patients and their traumatized parents. The groups supported by COCAP Face COVAP are very important for the survival of child therapies. These groups do for Ukrainian therapies what Ukrainian child therapies themselves hope to do for their young patients and their families. Containment, preservation of the ability to be together, to think, to develop to see the future, to distinguish between good and evil. We are grateful to Antonia Grimald, Monica Cardinal, Carlos Vasquez, Simona Nissim, Elena Fleche, Carlos Tam. More than three months, they supervise our four groups, support us by helping to think about the feeling of young patients, about their development, and uh, to withstand the unbearable feelings that children and adolescents bring to their therapies. One of group members, a colleague who is now accepted in France, spoke about unbearable anxiety and helplessness in sessions with a teenager girl a refugee girl in Austria. Today there was shelling in Ukraine and I listened the news and I am drawing pictures. Everything is terrible. I can't stay this anxiety anymore. I don't know how to describe. All my friends are there. I am here. I am helpless. These are the girls' words. One of group member, a colleague from Dnipro, spoke about the importance of this work with the COCAP COVAP committees. When the war started, I worked week after week waiting for the teenager pensions give up their therapies. And it would be possible to stop. But this didn't happen. A lot of anxiety. Reality testing is already difficult for these teenagers. And now there is a war and online sessions. My ability to think has changed. The feeling of child therapies are sometimes unbearable. Now, after half a year of the struggle for the survival of Ukrainian child psycho psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic psychotherapies, we know for sure what give us the opportunity not only to survive, but also to develop, being together with, with each other, together with international psychoanalytic community. Collaboration with APA com committees, 
collaboration with our refugee therapies with uh, the institutions and communities in different countries. And also important continuation and survival links and development, the training of three more Ukrainian child psychoanalysts who began training in the Hangroen Prakin Institute. This training continu continues and going to be successfully finished. Yes, this is not the first war in Europe experienced by psychoanalysis. And we are really sure that the war will end and Ukrainian psychoanalysis will develop and in turn help the development of child psychoanalysis in other countries. Technique and setting may change online and so on but most importantly we will definitely save and provide the ethics of APA psychoanalysis our honesty and openness for our young patients trust in development and humanistic values now every hour day for us is learning from experience what does it mean, humanistic values and uh, ethic of APA? Thank you for supporting us along our difficult way. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. And now we'll shift over to Arabair. I, I will say that uh, you can put questions in the chat box for our speakers and we'll be opening up to discuss those questions uh, after uh, this final presentation. Arabair, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I want to say it's a sad and tragic coincidence that we are having our webinar just in this week when the Russian army has again overrun and is overrun in Ukraine and Ukrainian civilians with massive bombardments. We have just also heard it from Alexandra and Anna. And also in this way, I would also first like to commemorate all the people who have been killed and wounded by these clear war crimes. And I would like to remember all the people who have become victims of Russia's, Russia's brutal war of aggression on Ukraine. The Russia against Ukraine war has claimed at least more than 6,000 lives among Ukrainian civilians, including at least 396 children as of October the 10th, 2022 according to counts of the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And the number of soldiers killed cannot be clearly determined, but it is certainly several tens of thousands on both sides. So many lives destroyed or injured, so many families amputated or torn apart, and so many towns, villages and houses destroyed, so much pain and grief among the citizens. As human beings and as psychoanalysts, we are horrified by so much cruelty and suffering. And alongside the horror, we all feel the powerlessness to the end of the war through our own actions. As psychoanalysts, we are also aware of the potential extent of human destructiveness that is now also being realized in such a terrible way by Russian aggression. As European analysts, immediate neighbors of our Ukrainian colleagues, however, we did not want to and could not remain inactive. And so today, I would like to give you a brief overview of the offers of help that we have made on the part of the PF. They relate to emotional and financial support in times of war. Immediately after the brutal invasion of Ukraine by the Russian army, we exchanged our concerns for our Ukrainian colleagues in the EPF executive and with all the presidents of the 42 societies of the EPF and discussed how to help and support our Ukrainian colleagues in the Ukrainian Psychoanalytic Society. The question of what could we best do went both in the direction of immediate humanitarian aid for our colleagues and a clear open statement against Russian aggression. As I said, it was and is important for us as psychoanalysts to represent our human values for the protection and preservation of all life clearly and against the power of human destruction. 
Therefore, I wrote a clear statement on behalf of the EPF, which we have also published on the EPF website. At the same time, it was important that this statement should, could not be used against our Russian colleagues. They are not on Putin's side. After that, we started to look for emotional and financial support for our Ukrainian colleagues. This help was aimed at first to face two inevitable issues following, following such an invasion. This is displacement and resettlement. On the one hand, we sought financial support both for those Ukrainian colleagues who had to flee Ukraine and for those who remained in Ukraine. On the other hand, we were looking for support in the domestic accommodation of refugee colleagues in various countries in Europe. As EPF, we provided an emergency aid of 20,000 euros to UPS and created a Ukraine support fund offered to our colleagues as a relay for transferring possible donations to the UPS. We then experienced a spontaneous and generous willingness to donate from the ranks of the national European Scientific societies. Because of the difficulties of banking, we set up one account in Ukraine and another in Hungary. We were in close contact with the colleagues of the Ukrainian society, especially with Alexandra Milza and his, uh, president, his president, but also with other colleagues, like for instance, Maria Budia, who organized the different possibilities to find accommodation for refugee colleagues. Alexandra worked in Hungary, Maria from the Netherlands, and other colleagues were in different countries of Europe, mainly Germany, Poland, and Czech Republic, but also others. It was not only financial help, but we also wanted to stay in an emotional exchange about the experience of trauma, the feelings of loss and separation from their homes that our colleagues had to suffer. This was also made possible by repeated online meetings that the UPS offered to all interested colleagues, mainly organized by Igor Roman. But now back to the organization of financial support and providing of accommodation. We created two subgroups. One group cared about the financial support. And here we had and have a good cooperation between the treasurer of the EPF, Andrea Gardini, and the treasurer of the IPA, Henk Jan Dalewik, together with Alexandra Mirza and the Ukrainian colleagues who are in charge of this. It was a constructive idea that the IPA and the EPF started a cooperation to find common solutions for the distribution of money. The IPA sent the first generous installments to the EPF Ukraine Support Fund and created an emergency fund to support the EPS with an allowance up to 100,000 US dollars. But the mentioned group of colleagues should decide how to use this money. Here we had also cooperation with very active groups of other countries. The first step was to transfer money and to spread it among the candidates of the UPS who needed it most of all. The second step, after opening the official UPS accounts, was a second larger transfer to spread money between other candidates and members of UPS to cope with the most critical issues. The total sum of donations from almost 30 European psychoanalytic societies, including the first installment of the IPA, was 171,221 euros. In connection with the first emergency payments that were done before the new EPF account was created, the total fund consistency was 194,600 euros. After several payments, the remaining balance on the fund is now 87,000 euros. Just to give some impression about this. Yeah. And I will say some words about the distribution of the remaining money in a minute. But before that, I want to describe the other subgroup that is led by Eva Glott, the secretary of the EPF, general secretary of the EPF. And she cooperates with Maria Budia and other colleagues from Ukraine to find adequate accommodation for refugee colleagues in different countries of Europe. These refugees include not only members of the UPS, but also colleagues from psychoanalytic and psychotherapeutic societies with whom the UPS is in good connection. Most refugees are in Poland now, Germany, Czech Republic, and also other countries. 
From the very beginning, we discussed the criteria for distributing the money and we decided to limit the donations to humanitarian support only. First for Ukrainian candidates and members who had no income anymore. I would like to cite an expression of the Treasurer Henk Jan Barlik that we should aim at helping the helpers, which was his formulation, helping the helpers, because we wanted to relate the financial support also to our profession as psychoanalysts. The aim is now to discuss a potential next step, because we could think of supporting a project that has been launched by the UPS in connection with the Melanie Klein Trust and other groups. This relates now to the treatment of traumatized citizens in Ukraine, to what and this, amongst others, in a meeting with UPS and our colleagues, Yervavi has described the necessary elements for analytical treatment of traumatized citizens. And uh, this project that Igor Romanov, the director of training of the UPS, had presented in more detail is in line, I think, with this um, program, Helping the Helpers, because it provides for individual groups of consultants that work with servicemen, children, refugees, and survivors of violence. ESAPF and, of course, the IPA, I think, as well, must discuss this idea together with the UPS. It would support the necessary emotional help for this group of traumatized victims because it could help them to have more sessions for their therapy and the Ukrainian colleagues who are working either in person in Ukraine or online from abroad could have more possibilities to offer their specific analytic support for traumatized Ukrainian citizens. All these measures, in my view, are in line with our efforts to also anchor psychoanalysis as a socially active and relevant force in society. It's a three-step model that started with an emergency fund and was then extended to more Ukrainian candidates and members to cope with the most critical, critical issues. And now we could be at a point where victims of the Russian attacks could get more emotional support and help for coping with their traumas if money if it could be available, available for more steps. I think it's a matter that we have to discuss further with the colleagues of the UPS and the other groups involved. I would like to conclude by saying that in these terrible times, the cohesion of all analysts within the EPF and the IPA is important. This includes our Russian colleagues in addition to our urgent commitment to our Ukrainian colleagues and their patients. They, the Russian colleagues, they have not been traumatically affected in the same way as our Ukrainian colleagues. Uh, this is very clear that our Ukrainian colleagues are much more in danger and under trauma uh, um, influences. But the Russian colleagues are in danger, in a different kind of danger, and we all, I think, need our mutual solidarity. And tragically, Russia continues to escalate the war by bombing civilian targets. And yet, I hope that there can be an end to this murderous war and more peace in the foreseeable future even though we all know the power of human destructiveness. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Eric, there. And now we've heard from our three panelists. Uh, we're inviting questions uh, in the chat from the audience. But I, I have a few questions uh, based on the presentations just to get us started. Uh, while other questions come in. And, um, you know, Anna, your image, and it's not just an image, it's a direct report of the destroyed playroom uh, with the picture, the broken picture of Winnicott is particularly poignant, uh, especially when we think about Winnicott and, and his more than 50 BBC broadcasts to parents of children caught up in the blitz in British cities during World War II. And um, you, you spoke about your concerns about how children will internalize their experience of war. Are there lessons you think from Winnicott or others were lessons learned in the course of what you're responding to the, this, this last year that we can apply for this war? 
uh, it is very interesting that uh, last time uh, maybe the most important uh, term or theory in our minds it's uh, idea about containment because uh, if to think about uh, Winnicottian holding, we sometimes can't uh, provide this holding because uh, this holding is destroyed and changed every day. But uh, containment, something that we can uh, take in and uh, elaborate together with a child. Maybe it is our survival now. And then I hope we will uh, uh, survive internal holding and uh, build external one, new hands, new handling, new houses, new rooms. But this term containment, even colleagues who are not very much Bionian, so called, everybody take it inside. You know, I, even as you speak, I, I think of Anna Freud and Dorothy Burlingham's book, Children in War, which they wrote about their experiences bringing children out of those bombed cities to safety. But one of the things that surprised them was that the children, at least on the surface, seemed to function better with their parents in the war zone than they did in the safety of the countryside. Uh, I don't think they were healthier. I, I, I just think that they were able to somehow contain this themselves while they were with their parents uh, and their friends. And being taken out of their context was good in some ways. It was physically safer. But psychologically, it, it took the lid off their, their, their concerns. Uh, I guess that's one lesson, perhaps. I don't know if that's been seen in Ukraine with children either who become refugees. Perhaps, Alexandra, you've seen this in refugee families have gone to physical safety, but now are experiencing responses to war that they hadn't seen before. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, I faced with very different experience, and uh, every child experienced this war and refugee in different way. Uh, for some children, you are right; they feel relief because this intrusion of sirens, intrusions of uh, uh, actually, if not bombing, but but sirens and news, and these news are everywhere. So um, it stopped, or at least uh, diminished, and of course it brings relief. But uh, as you know, children very dependent on their parents and their parents' emotional state. So, and uh, even if it is a physical uh, safetyness, the emotional inner anxiety could continue long, a long uh, time ago, and. Uh, uh, also, some children who comes here, I mean abroad, they left their fathers in Ukraine. And it's very, very dramatic, has dramatically influence on the family and on the children. For some people, for some children, it's unbearable to bear uh, the, the, this uh, separate of the family. And they are very worried about their father who is under threat. So, uh, so, so, I can't say, I can't take only one uh, response, that only one way is uh, possible. So some children would like to return because they are very missing their homes, their stories and their fathers. And uh, it's difficult for them to bear mother's anxiety. So it's very, very difficult, different and difficult, of course. Mm -hmm. Erebar, I don't know if in Germany uh, you're, you have any observations you'd like to share about displaced Ukrainian families or displaced children. 
Yes, um, I, I can say that um, um, we have also this observation that there is this difference which you mentioned that there are uh, on one hand uh, Ukrainian families who are here in Germany in safety and just from let's say from the uh, from the kind of physical safety yeah but that is on the very important the question what is the internal safety feeling of safety and uh, and I fully agree uh, also to what you said Harold and all your others said that it's very important uh, just not to neglect uh, the internal safety and I also have uh, some um, experiences that uh, children, also uh, partially women, uh, want to return uh, to Ukraine because they want to live with their parents or uh, husbands. Yeah. So, and this is very important uh, to see how how the families can uh, be held together, held, held together. And uh, and what I also want to say, perhaps this, uh, it's very important to have several groups uh, to create something which I would call, perhaps you know the, this uh, image of Anna Selbstred, the mother who holds the mother. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we, as a as psychoanalyst and as also on an institutional level, I think we are also perhaps in a similar way that we. Uh, need and we do this on in European level, on IPA level, but also here in Germany, to have groups uh, who hold um, Ukrainian colleagues uh, just here or just have contact to them in Ukraine, so that they can also feel held and that they just are able to hold either their families or their patients. So, and this is something which I find uh, very impressive also. And perhaps, I don't know whether I will talk too long, but uh, I can say this perhaps later, what I was going to say. Thank you, thank you. Let, we have some questions from the audience and let's, uh, I'll read the first of these. Have you, dis and I think this is to anyone who'd like to respond. Have you discovered any helpful ways of protecting the inner lives of the children you help? Any ways of strengthening psychological sense of safety when the objective circumstances are dangerous? In some ways you've spoken to this a bit, but if anyone wanted to add to that, ways of strengthening the psychological sense of safety when in fact the circumstances are truly dangerous. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think now uh, about this uh, uh, this choice to return back to Ukraine to Ukraine to be near fathers to be together under bombing but together the whole family to to uh, to survive like uh, unit like family like like uh, who maybe it is more about uh, this uh, psychological sense of safety because uh, of course uh, um, technically much more safe in uh, europe it's it's true but uh, maybe uh, some mothers and uh, children uh, themselves feel uh, some danger of this uh, break, up, break up, this distance. And also because nobody knows if you are not with your father today, tomorrow your father will be alive. Nobody knows. You know, this, this goes to a question that just came in. Uh, how useful are the technological ways of communication when mothers and children are separated from fathers? Either mm -hmm. they're all in Ukraine and the father is fighting in a different part of the country or even maybe in the same city, but, but separate. Uh, or if they're in different countries. And I must tell you, this reminds me 
Early on in our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, American troops didn't have a way to contact their families. Uh, there weren't enough uh, communication systems. And everyone said, well, we really need to bring in telephones and satellites. And, and eventually our military did a wonderful job. So it was possible to pick up a phone and talk to your family without waiting long, but it led to a different problem, uh, which was that the person in the safe surrounding was saying, our child got a bad report from her teacher. And what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> and, 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 and or, 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 or the soldier in the combat area would, would, would not wanna talk about what was going on or was going on a mission right after this phone call. And in some ways it created more stress. So instant communication, consistent communication can be a blessing or a curse, depending. But, but here, this question is, um, how useful are the technological ways of communication when children and, and parents are separated, especially? Yeah. Thoughts on this? Hopefully we have the, these uh, ways. And uh, you, 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 maybe you know, many, many of uh, colleagues and me also, uh, five years ago, maybe uh, we were uh, extremely against the, uh, this way of uh, providing therapeutic work. No, no, only personally. Mm. But, but now, now it's uh, really uh, another attitude. Yes, even in the face of COVID, I, I know in Europe especially, in America, oh, we do it <laughs> uh, more. Uh, but it, it sounds like it didn't penetrate as well because of COVID, but now necessity. And, and also about survival. For example, now I am here in Ukraine, but I can communicate with you. And uh, maybe if to think about uh, mental survival of uh, children who can communicate with friends, with teachers, uh, with psychotherapists, it's, it's really the way of, uh, uh, to survive, uh, survive thinking uh, and more, maybe even uh, physical survival because uh, it prevents depression. Actually, it is a help to be connected, yeah, to help to feel this, uh, uh, to have this feeling that, uh, that the, you are not alone, yeah, in this world. And there is a adult one, the father, for example, or the therapist who, on, or other relatives or whatever, who can, uh, um, what Anna have already said, contain, to be in contact and take in the, all this anxiety, all this fear of the child and help him to digest it. So I think so now it's uh, become something very, very important and necessary if to speak about the communication. Yes, we are, we are contained, uh, all of us. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Can can I perhaps just add to this? Uh, just this, what I because um, also um, meeting Ukrainian colleagues here in Germany um, several times, I'm always really very impressed uh, by the way and this uh, by the way how um, I say uh, they confident they are uh, just in doing their work and uh, despite all uh, their uh, experiences of, of uh, trauma and also a lot of, of psychic pain. But this relates to the question how children uh, can also be strengthened in their internal uh, feelings. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, for me, this is very important and this is also different from a kind of denial. But I, I'm thinking of there, there are parents, mm -hmm. uh, there's an image of parents who are very anxious by themselves and just play uh, uh, towards their children a kind of security they don't feel. And then this, mm -hmm. I think this very happens in, in several forms of war and trauma. And of, this might happen here too. But in the children, of course, they are sensitive and they feel it. 
But my impression here, and this I don't know what you think, Alexandra and Anna, but my impression here is that the Ukrainian colleagues I meet, they are all aware of the danger. They are all you you all are all aware of of uh, the potential loss of, of friends, relatives, yeah, family members, but at the same time. There is really, really a huge cohesion and mutual emotional support between all of you, but also with other psychoanalysts, other groups outside the country, outside Ukraine uh, to Europe. And I think, and, and this is, I want to support also the meaning now of, of this uh, online communication. Also, the fact that we can talk to you, Anna, this uh, evening here, I think this gives another feeling. There, there is something without denial. Yeah? This, I think, this is very important to my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that there is other feeling uh, of of feeling held by somebody else, which really could give more uh, feeling of of safety, yeah? uh, an internal safety. Mm -hmm. At the same time, knowing what could happen. Yeah, of, um, but I, I am, just to uh, repeat this, I am very, very impressed by this, also, especially by all Ukrainian colleagues I meet here in Germany. Mm -hmm. I also and would like, may, I also would like uh, to add uh, one more point to the communication and communication with peers, that uh, the children refugee comes to their surroundings where there is a different language, another language. And it's also prevent them to feel, uh, no, to, to, how to say, to feel free to communicate, to build the connection among the peers. And that is crucial, important for adolescents to be in a group, to be in a group of peers. Uh, so in this uh, situation, this connection with former friends becomes more and more important again. So I just would like to emphasize. Mm -hmm. You know, questions are beginning to pour in, which is wonderful. I, I have to say, though, that just what each of you is saying makes me think, what does it mean to be safe? What what has to be safe? Uh, is it our bodies? Is it our relatives? Is it our internal organization? You know, uh, what's, it's a big question. I, I <laughs> But maybe we'll think about that. And But I want to attend to what, what our participants are asking. Um, question. Could you please give a concrete case of how teens fail reality testing based on their extreme anxiety, fear, and loss of defenses? Is this something that people are seeing? I think, Anna, some of your comments may have inspired this. I'm not sure. But the idea of losing reality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's difficult now to, uh, to speak about uh, concrete cases. <laughs> With so open audience, it's, um, uh, but may, maybe not a concrete case, but uh, some kind of um, of the picture how we can understand this. Uh, for example, uh, um, I, I can think about a teenager uh, who have. Uh, a lot of protest of everybody around and uh, who, who can feel this that uh, everybody are against uh, him everybody against him his independence and uh, he should fight and uh, so so on and this person can come to the situation when really uh, everybody around against him physically, concretely, and uh, people to whom he wanted to project this fight, they are people who can save him. 
so it, it is a very big mixture inside who are enemy who are uh, supportive people where i am and it is very big problem because uh, this kind of mixture inside prevent thinking and really the nature uh, could uh, feel uh, him or herself absolutely disappointed where i am i need to fight with father i need to uh, be cruel with my mother or i should support and what to do so it's uh, mm -hmm. It is difficult to say concretely how it, it could be, but uh, this mixture is in our minds also, in minds of uh, a child therapist. Sometimes we don't know when the child say to us, uh, teenager, for example, I want to be independent, I want to leave my family and uh, leave the therapy uh, next month and we have in our mind what what does it mean what will be next month when everybody are shocked from this new serial bombing he really wants to be independent or he wants to project all all danger inside us and leave us with this danger what to mm. say to him go ahead or oh, sorry, but uh, you should stay and uh, to to elaborate together with me. I don't know. You know, in in America, I think in many countries, uh, school children read the diary of Anne Frank, and um, her father removed certain pages from the diary when it before it was published because they were very critical of her mother. And, uh, you know, a 13 year old girl living in an attic, uh, having to be silent all the time in constant danger. And, and I, as you were speaking, Anna, I was thinking that maybe some of Anne Frank's anger at her mother, which having raised teenage girls, I'm used to having children angry at me. Uh, but, but maybe this is a, a very common phenomenon. What do I do? with powerlessness, what do I do with fear? What do I do with rage? Uh, how do I deal with the fact that the people who are supposed to contain me aren't, can't, and it's not their fault, but they can't contain me. Where does all that go? Mm. Mm. There, new, new questions are coming up. Um, are, uh, uh, there are many projects around Europe collecting stories from the victims of the atrocities. In many countries, groups are where people uh, meet to tell what they have experienced. How do you see these projects? And what can be done so that Ukrainians do not get re-traumatized in the extensive retelling of their traumatic experience? It's really, we receive a lot of proposition to share the stories and um, of course it could be different uh, attitudes towards it and uh, I think uh, it depends on the level of the trauma and of the level of, and to the wish of the character, yeah, to the wish of the concrete person, meaning that uh, for someone it is a relief to share this experience, yeah, to get rid of it, to rethink about it more and more, but for, and they agree for, for such kind of uh, activities, they share their experience, and also in this uh, uh, in, in this uh, action to share the experience, there is an action, there is a question, there is an ask for help, I think. So when people would like to share, they would like to take something, you no, know, help in, in the way of rare think about what is going on, to digest it. And of course, there are someone for, for whom this experience was 
overwhelming, yeah, and it, it is still overwhelming. And the person try to keep it aside somewhere, not to even touch it. And uh, probably this um, this would be our uh, future patience in some time. I think it's. Uh, mm. I, we will faced with the wave of the PTSD and um, such kind of difficulties, and uh, probably my personal opinion, yes. Yeah, so probably it's uh, when it's when this proposition is not very intruding, but like uh, invitation or proposition, and the person agree to do it. Uh, further actions depend on the so-called interviewer or the 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 the, the, the contact person who should be very delicate in this way it's not a truth uh, but it's true and sometimes i think that uh, children for example or teenagers who are patients of therapist uh, now be, before who, who were th patients before the war uh, they are a little bit in uh, uh, better situation because uh, they before the war had uh, somebody with whom there was an experience how to share how to speak how to be li uh, listened and heard but uh, many usual children usual ch teenagers are now in the state what to do to avoid to reject tragic experience or to share or how to share as alexandra said very slow and delicate or overwhelming so, but uh, it's uh, i also think that uh, um, it, it will be a, a long way how to re uh, repair Repair, uh, repair all, all these yeah. things, stability, and uh, it's it's difficult. Mm. Eric, Eric, it looks like you might. Add. Yes, I, I, um, I just want to add because I today I'm speaking more from uh, the point of view of the EPF, uh, so institutional aspect. I could also say a lot of uh, this psychoanalytic uh, aspect. I think this, but this is crucial, perhaps just to just to say this for, for uh, trauma, just for for just uh, general uh, treatment of traumatized people uh, and traumatized patients. That we as psychoanalysts uh, just are there, that we present ourselves as being there and just wait uh, what, uh, how the, these uh, patients react to it, whether they uh, just want to tell more or whether just they want to be more uh, just left alone at the same time, but uh, in our contact with us. What I want to say um, is this on an institutional level, this is we thought we wanted to do to behave as EPF in, in exactly this same way. Yeah, so there's we, we uh, perhaps you are asking all the time what is he talking about all the money all the time. Yeah, but I think uh, <laughs> this money is something which is important uh, that because we provided, uh, we, we collected the money, and I personally am very grateful to a lot of psychoanalytic societies all over Europe because they really spontaneously sent a lot of money from uh, to this uh, EPF fund. But and and then, but we wanted to collect this money uh, and also together with the money, our emotional presence at the same time, this, uh, and then give it to you and then as to Ukrainian colleagues, and then you are the ones who decide how to use it. So in connection with us, not totally alone, yeah, but it's, um, uh, I ex appreciate this exchange, but I think it's just exactly this way of behaving yeah, that uh, just to to uh, present something which you then some 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 presence i would say also financial presence connected with emotional presence but you are the ones who decide how to use it how you use this yeah so one can do this also this i want to say on an institutional level not only in treatments but also in our ways how we just uh, 
um, yeah, behaving on an institutional league to each other. For me, there is one more point where uh, uh, clinical, uh, individual clinical uh, experience uh, uh, meet with institutional experience. Uh, because as I say, we have traumatized patients, uh, traumatized parents, traumatized psychotherapist or psychoanalyst, traumatized Ukrainian society, but we have uh, IPA, we have institutions yes. uh, in the yeah. world who are not so much traumatized. And that is why uh, we, we have hopes to be a little bit uh, uh, less traumatized than our patients because mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the support of world uh, um, society. Without yes. society, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also mm -hmm. would like to add to this, yes, that it's very important also that uh, there is a societies who have already experienced the war, I mean former Yugoslavian countries, and of mm -hmm. course Germany, Israel, so, and there is a lot of uh, uh, scientific uh, article papers and knowledge where, uh, that, that people can share with us. So, and I think it's also very important that this way, which we just expected to go, has been already done by others, and we can be uh, th this experience could be shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me bring up another question. Do you use artistic means, uh, expressive means, to contain the pain? And that's an interesting question itself. Uh, do you use artistic means to contain the pain? Music, drawing, is religion helpful? Yeah. Even how, how to answer, of course. What, what, what to say? Actually, uh, from my point of view, it's also depend of the level of traumatize of the children or adult, and it uh, can be visible how much person is active or on the other side withdrawal. Yeah. So I think such kind of expression methods is good for the person who less traumatized, and they uh, or they can how to say they are not fr 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 frozen and then can express their feelings in body or in movement or whatever. Uh, and it's very helpful to use drawings for children and also for adults because the paper of the, the, the paper is, could be seen as a container as well. And everything which is uh, put there, could, could left there and brings uh, relief to the um, patients. And I, I can't say nothing about religious, so I think it's very, it's not easy point. And from my point of view, religion more uh, turned to such kind of, uh, uh, how to say, what is good, what is bad, yeah, and probably the idea for, for, ch for children, I mean, for adult, of course, there is other transcendental meaning, but... But probably would like to it. You you know in his may, car. May I share? Mm -hmm. go, ahead, no, go on. I was just going to say in his correspondence with Oscar Pfister, who was certainly one of Freud's best friends and, and most mm -hmm. most loyal friends. Uh, Pfister says I because he was a he was a, a minister. I can help mm. people from my position as a minister and a psychoanalyst. And Freud said, I am sure you help people as a minister, but just when you do that, don't call it psychoanalysis. <laughs> I have no trouble with you, but, but psychoanalysis cannot appeal to religious ideas and still be the uncovering, opening up, you know, I don't know, I still, I still struggle with that. And I'm sure the two men continue to struggle with this, but we do have some precedent for this conversation. 
<laughs> but Eric. No, I, I just, just due to this question, I, I just want to share an experience I had with a, a 10 year old boy in therapy just uh, some month ago. Uh, just, just to make it short, of course, he is a German boy. He's not a Ukrainian boy. He's living in uh, just a very um, uh, well organized, yeah, yeah, I think so, well organized uh, family. But he had some difficulties uh, just um, in behaving in school. Um, but what I, then he did in the therapy, and he started with this in therapy, he started to draw paintings and he, uh, with me and to draw tanks. And, mm -hmm. and he put the Ukrainian flag on the tanks. And, and then he drew Russian tanks and he was shooting with his Ukrainian flags uh, to the Russian tanks. And I just want to say, I, I want to make it short, but I was all the time wondering what is happening here. Uh, because on one hand, uh, it could be a kind of uh, um, way for him to express his aggression by externalizing his, his uh, uh, aggression towards um, another uh, socially accepted enemy. Yeah? I think this could be one aspect. The other aspect, but uh, and this is what I think was happening also by drawing, I think gradually he was also more and more uh, uh, developing a certain uh, feeling of concern. He was very concerned also uh, about uh, what was happening in Ukraine, and he could grasp uh, the uh, in his. But he he was an intelligent boy, uh, and also sensitive, uh, empathetic boy. Just what by the question of what can help? This is not just for a traumatized boy, but uh, even this uh, political and historical um, um, yes development. I want to tell you this also affects uh, German, uh, for instance, German mm -hmm. children, yeah, some German children who uh, just are dealing with this too. So you see, there are a lot of influences uh, on different levels. I'm going to mention we have a fewer than 10 minutes left. Uh, so that people who have questions, this would be a good time to put them into the chat. Perhaps the panelists have questions for one another as well. Uh, can I say a couple of words about this question uh, about artistic means to contain the pain? Uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, I feel disagreement with this uh, uh, words uh, means to contain the pain. For me, uh, containment, uh, it's about uh, relationship. Uh, I can share, I can express myself uh, with a painting or dancing or singing, but uh, the next step for containing it's uh, the person who can answer to my dancing or painting on something else. So not uh, uh, not artistic means contain pain, not picture contain pain, but uh, the person who are together with you and who can understand you through pa through painting, through dancing, but to understand you. So I, I think that uh, in this sense, uh, we, we can be near the child, uh, even in George and, or somewhere, dancing, thinking, but, uh, but the person, mother, father, psychotherapist, human being. Mm -hmm. Containment sounds like, right, I'm holding this, but in fact, as you, as you said earlier, containment happens between people. It e even internalized people, but also people, the people in our lives and our culture. I, I, I wanna mention, you know, I, I, I said earlier on that a decision was made to not invite Russians here. And there was concern also about exposing Russians 
to maybe being identified uh, and, and uh, in ways that would be harmful to them as well. Uh, also to create the freedom to talk about feelings from inside Ukraine. I, I, I wanna mention there are other forums going on that come to mind as we speak about containment and we speak about the international community. The, the International Psychologic Institute, which is more of a training program, has since February been running town hall meetings which have included Ukrainian uh, psychoanalysts, Russians, Croatians, Lithuanian, uh, American. And um, it's been meeting at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, uh, since the beginning of the war. And, and I do wanna mention that this is a different kind of group for a different purpose. And as I think about what you're all saying and what we've talked about today, I think one of the functions of that group is to contain hope for the future and to keep alive an idea that we are colleagues, we share principles and values and that we can survive this as, as psychoanalysts, uh, keep, this, keep that alive. Uh, anyone who is interested in this group could Google uh, IPI, the International Psychoanalytic Institute, and it is an open group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, even Freud and Jones, as I understand it, managed to stay in touch with one another all through World War I. Uh, mm. And the International Psycholytic Association did an incredible job of quickly becoming fully international soon after the war. Uh, it comes to mind, that history comes to mind as you speak about where we are and, and, and where we hope to be. Well, and we're seeing an announcement here about upcoming webinars, uh, the, the fourth IPA Asia Pacific Conference uh, in November uh, of 2022. Uh, and uh, I think people can read for themselves, but to visit the IPA.world, uh, www.ipa.world, for the latest information on all upcoming webinars and recordings. This would be a good time, I think, for me to thank the panelists who have done a wonderful job and the participants who have uh, framed questions and, and, and come through it, well over 130, uh, 144 at, at one point uh, from across the world. Uh, conversations like this are containment. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Mm. Any last comments? So we have just three minutes. Any last comments from any of our panelists? Thank you very much. Can, uh, perhaps, mm. Oh, <laughs> you feel still, Alexander? Alexander. No, 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 it will be too long. Just, uh, I, I wonder that uh, we, that the topic was about emotional experience and we were speaking about from organizational points of view as well, but the questions was mostly individually, how to cope and how to understand what to do. And I think about this uh, over overlapping how, uh, big global and uh, small individual levels are uh, intervening each other. And of course, I would okay. like to say thank you for all the questions, for all the company and the opportunity to share. These concepts, these models do nest into one another. <laughs> but that's also- Can I just say, can I just say that I, I appreciate really very much uh, uh, the way all Ukrainian colleagues uh, um, that I met uh, are dealing uh, with uh, their, um, on one hand, their feelings of grief and pain, and at the same time of confidence and hope. And and this is which I really, really, uh, I'm very impressed by this. And I also, once again, I uh, experienced this today with both of you, with uh, Alexandra and Anna. And uh, this is something which is very impressive for me. And uh, is also, I, I'm grateful for this, that you can uh, show this to us and convey this to us. 
And I just personally want to thank also Harold. Uh, thank you for your excellent um, chairing this webinar. Thank you very much. It's, it, it's really been my honor. I, I, I also share my admiration for what you're all doing and, and doing under such circumstances. And I think it is time for us to call this to a close. And thank you very much. And I look forward to new op opportunities to work with all of you. Thank you.